Thanks, Matthew. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll try not to be too long. I know that everybody wants to go to lunch. That's the, the penalty of the last presentation of the morning. Um, before I talk more precisely about precision agriculture, I would like to put that research in context. And I have a few slides about what we have been trying to do in CIMIT in terms of putting our research in context. The first slide is not, it's not wheat. It's a, it's a village in eastern Niger, in uh, western Niger, east of Niamey, and that's per millet. Uh, what you can see, in fact, in that landscape is that, in fact, all the, the eye variability in terms of plant grow with the first you know, area around the village getting more organic matter, having better plant growth. And, and farmers, that's one of the poorest spots on earth. In fact, it's chronic food deficiencies there. Very strong shocks also, uh, like the 2005 famine when I was still there. But farmers there are managing, are uh, practicing precision agriculture. In fact, what you can see also that they are adapting the planting density on the perceived fertility of the soil. They are also using uh, land races with shorter or longer duration based also on the perception of the fertility of the soil. They are also moving crop residues from one part of the field to another part of the field when they see that that part of the field doesn't produce anything then that's really precision agriculture. They're not using anything else than the eyes, the perceptions, and the memory of what they've been investing. At a different scale also, and that was an interesting study, uh, people in that village and many villages in Niger have dispersed fields. One family has three, four, five fields that are not all located in the same direction in the village. Uh, and that means that one farmers could have one field there, one field there, and one field way beyond. Uh, basically, in fact, that dispersion of fields reduce, in fact, the risk of, of, uh, of drought or complete failure in crop production because the initial rainfalls in that environment have very short spatial dependence. Just, there were many quotes from Norman Bullock. I found a quote from Jerry Atfield that just came out into the, the CSA March 2014 issue. And I think that was much discussed also uh, yesterday uh, by, by different speakers. And in fact, it's how you integrate technologies and make, it, make them useful in a system that's important. It's not the te technology by itself. I will not be long on that because it was presented also by various speakers uh, yesterday. The challenge is, of course, increasing uh, food production at the global level. And you have quite a lot of uh, pressure. You have the disease, you have the water and nutrient and energy scarcity, and that was presented yesterday and this morning. The climate change issue as well. And then, well, you basically have two technologies to uh, fit together uh, to find that, and that's what research has been doing in the agricultural field uh, since it was created. It's just the agronomy and the breeding. Also, that was discussed by Sir Gordon Conway yesterday, but sometimes the term sustainable intensification is not used to its extent. I think many people consider sustainable intensification as sustainable uh, productivity and yield increase. But it's also about economics, profitability, social equity, and environmental friendliness. That means it's dealing with complex and heterogeneous systems at many, many scales. Uh, that's one way of looking at uh, farming systems, small order farming systems. That's a publication from a colleague from Irvi Mario Ero in science that was also led by the, the System Wide Livestock Program. Uh, something that also, as biophysical scientists, we don't look too often at are the drivers of change in systems. And in fact, trying to swim against those drivers with technologies is not very productive. You need to understand how those drivers are shaping the present and the future of the systems. And they are, well, also named yesterday, but it's population growth, urbanization, climate change, consumption patterns, income change. Uh, you have the different scales. You have the farming systems. Within the farming systems, you have crops, you have rangeland, and you have forests. Then you have the landscape scale, which is a kind of a fuzzy notion. You have the regional and the global scales. 
Of course, all the processes in those systems are just, you know, uh, occur between, between scales and a lot of interaction. That's uh, a recent framework we've put, very simple one. You can have much more complex one, but the challenge of systems research is just to deal with complexity and heterogeneity without being lost in complexity. And basically, between the, I would say, the agronomy and the socioeconomic group in, in CIMIT and in other CG centers, we are working a lot on technology generation. And that's at the field scale, at the household and farming system scale, the community and landscape system scales, and looking at institutional and, and, and markets. And basically, we have for many technologies very low adoption, and very low adoption because we are agronomists and we just find fantastic the performance we have at the field scale. But not often enough, we are, looking at, we are not looking at the implication of integrating those technologies in, uh, in the more system approach. The process research is very important as well. I mean, it's looking at the dynamics of those systems, both on the biophysical side, but also on the social and the economic side. And I mean, those methods have been known for long, you know, the participatory methods uh, and the co-innovation and learning. But again, sometimes we are too commodity focused on those. And I think the livelihood framework is a good one, but complex one to follow. More and more, I think, as we talk about business models, I mean, that was said also yesterday, farmers are business, business people. Uh, sometimes they're very difficult business to run, but they are still business people. Also, the private sector being involved more and more in the systems where we work, and we have the, the public sector. Then business models are very important, in fact, to develop. Innovation systems also has been used quite a lot. Innovation systems are sometimes more useful to learn about processes than as a, a, an outscale and upscaling mechanism uh, as, as such. Uh, many people have sometimes have been very optimistic about how you can outscale from innovation systems. It's not always that straightforward. Uh, and then you have the enabling and analysis tools, and that's uh, typologies, trade-off, bioeconomic models all the geospatial aspects that are important. And of course, we are all targeting the same expected outcome, and we link for that with last mile providers. It can be private, public sector, NGOs, extension services. Also, just looking at productivity itself, it's not good enough. I think we have to look at productivity, we have to look at the main is efficiency in the systems, and it can be input efficiencies, nutrient efficiencies, labor efficiencies, land efficiencies, and depending what the limiting or the constraining factor in a system, that can be quite different. Stability is very important as well. I mean, the, the reliability also, the resilience, the adaptability. I mean, buffer capacity of small order farmers is much lower than in, in, in many other systems. Usually the buffer, is played, buffer role is played by livestock in those systems. Also, we need to work with more indicators and metrics, and that's not a straightforward thing as well, but basically, when you try to shape, improve a system through uh, farming systems design, you just go into synergies and trade-offs between different things you want to improve, and uh, usually, you cannot improve everything. Even in the same landscape, you can work with small farms or large farms, and the problems, the assets are different, the social capital is different, the capital is different. The solutions are usually not the same. Then they're coming with blank recommendation in the landscape is usually not likely to work for everybody. Resource allocation, decision making at the farm level is a key. I mean, farmers are the one taking decision on what they want to do and what they will do. Understanding better resource allocation, cash, labor, nutrients, off-farm opportunities are very critical, in fact, to provide a set of possible solution or technological options for farmers. The dynamic of, of systems is also very important. What we want all to see is an improvement in those systems, improvement of the livelihood of, system, of, of, of the people living from agriculture uh, in, in those systems. Then that's a collaboration we have with Wagen University. It can become very conceptual. I think they've been very good scientific paper on systems research. We have yet to see really the implementation of those uh, 
I would say, approaches, uh, theoretical or conceptual approach to serve, in fact, development. Going now more to nutrient management, uh, that's a recent paper in Nature showing the yield gap that we have in the world. I mean, we can see that Africa on major cereals, first, not a lot of land for cereals in, in West Africa when you look at the whole continent. It's West Africa, East and, East and Southern Africa. It's almost all red. I mean, people are using three, four, five kg of fertilizer per year per hectare on average on, in Sub-Saharan Africa. You have India, which is kind of a patchy thing, but probably uh, not much yield gap to realize in the Indo-Gangetic plains of, of India, Pakistan, and going down to Bangladesh, and that's the breadbasket of South Asia. Pakistan, I mean, all green in China, and then you can see now about the application of nitrogen in those systems, and it's all, uh, of course, uh, deficient in Africa, no use of fertilizer and overuse of fertilizers, somehow in, in South Asia, a lot in China. That's a slight uh, borrow from, uh, from Dr. Subarao two, two days ago. I follow his presentation. And I was amazed to see, in fact, the decrease in uh, nitrogen use efficiency overall uh, in a very short time. In a period of, of, of 50 years, it went from over 70% uh, to less than 30 uh, that means that we are spoiling energy, we are spoiling an env our environment because that nitrogen goes somewhere, either in the ground table or it goes in the streams, in the sea, uh, or it goes in the atmosphere, contributing to greenhouse gas uh, uh, in the atmosphere. Subarao is working on a quite more upstream innovative approach on uh, biological nitrification inhibition, and, and I will not talk more about that, but it's very interesting to look at what they are doing at JECAS in collaboration with SIAT and CIBIT on that. Now let's go to precision agriculture, and I think the way we understand precision agriculture can be quite different from one person to another one. I think it's precision agriculture for small order farmers, and we should see it at multiple scale. In fact, sometimes the most urgent uh, needs for farmers is better allocation of the resource at the farm scale, not within the field. And also the inter-farm inter relationship and resource allocation are, are important, especially in a mixed crop livestock system. Then for me, in fact, when I talk about precision agriculture for small older farmers, it's more precise agriculture, and it's looking at the spatial and temporal dimension of, of things, and answering the when, the what, and the how in terms of, of management of, of, of resources. A question, why should new technologies not benefit small older farmers of the world? I mean, if you look at the penetration rate of, of cell phones, for example, it's very high. I mean, it's very recent technology. It's when was your first uh, cell phone? It was less than 30 years ago, less than 20 years ago. If you look at the success of penetration of cell phone, it's almost everywhere, a little bit less in the Boana region in Ethiopia, but it's quite, quite striking. And we can expect to have, I would say, more affordable uh, smartphone uh, soon in those systems. Most of the cell phones are just you know, the first generation of cell phones with SMS functions, but they are already used in Kenya, for example, for payment of inputs, for banking operations, and so on. Uh, we are building a precision agriculture approach around uh, four building blocks, and the remote sensing and the monitoring tools, that's more the diagnosis, the spatial and temporal dimension of, of things in farming. A lot of uh, work has been done already at the field level in terms of nutrient water and disease management, using crop modeling, integrating also climate and weather data, and that's how you turn a diagnosis into recommendation. Then the potential of tapping on the information and communication technologies to get diagnosis from farmers but also provide recommendation. It's also a very in interesting path for crowdsourcing and getting more information about systems, about diseases, about deficiencies in systems. Mechanization and small scale mechanization in particular, and that's how you apply some of your recommendation in the fields. And that's, I will not talk more about that, but we have, we have a small scale, small mechanization two wheel tractor research that's quite interesting. Um, and of course, articulation of those blocks are system specifics. Uh, 
and they need the development of specific business model. We don't have a blueprint in uh, just introducing conservation, uh, precision agriculture in, in systems. Uh, it's going very fast now. Let's lock the button. How much time, uh, Matthew? Five? Yeah, that's fine. Well, that's the way we are looking at decision support uh, tools for farmers in, in Bangladesh. We are developing a project right now around um, additional uh, intensification of systems through a dry season uh, crop and access to surface water. And that's the type of information we use. Uh, we are starting to talk more about crop insurance in link with microcredits. And I think, in fact, in risk management in smallholder systems, I think that's something that could potentially uh, benefit a lot and, and increase systems productivity, allowing farmers to take a little bit more risk. Uh, fertility management practices, uh, usually it's blanket recommendation for a large area. It's based on all data. Usually it's derived from on-station experiments, not farmer fields. And it doesn't match the local condition and the risk as well. You know, you might not invest the same way if you know that your likelihood of getting a lot of rain uh, is, is low than if you have uh, the likelihood of having more rain. Um, that's the ongoing work uh, that's done in CISA in the uh, indo gangetic Plains uh, in South Asia, um, which in collaboration with, with Siri. And, uh, well, that's the way we articulate all those, those issues. We are prototyping, eh? it's not yet uh, at scale, but that's what we have in mind for that work. You saw when, if you did the field visit, Ivan Ortiz Monastorio did present uh, some of the work done with the Green Seeker. Uh, Nelly did present some of the work on mechanization. That's similar, that is the same philosophy, in fact, in terms of providing more information on nutrient management to, uh, to farmers. Uh, I'll skip that one, but that's the same, uh, the same, the same philosophy uh, on that. One outscaling achievement, and I think Ivan did mention it, uh, so far, I mean, until last year, or, yeah, pe people had to go, extension services had to go to the field with the green seeker and just go and uh, just sample the enriched nutrient strip and then go to the, the, the field and see what, uh, what to do in terms of uh, additional input of, of nitrogen. Mexico has the chance to have a good uh, temporal coverage of spot, spot six imagery and I think the, the collaboration between uh, Sagarpa and Simit uh, and Siap uh, have led to that, the development of that prototype platform when the farmer can of delineate his field, the enriched strip, and get recommendation on nitrogen application. Again, it's a prototype. It looks quite promising, especially in systems where people have access to internet. Of course, that wouldn't work in Africa right now. Something also as about timing in, in agriculture. Timing is very important, and that's part of the precision agriculture. Uh, what you can see here is a decrease of yield in the Indo-Gangetic Plains related to the planting date. And in fact, the later the planting, uh, <laughs> the more chance you get to, to, to get terminal heat stress and quite, quite visible. Uh, that's a contribution of conservation agriculture. I mean, somebody mentioned this morning is no evidence of conservation agriculture in terms of water management. I think we have a lot of evidence that conservation agriculture is contributing a lot to uh, uh, saving water in irrigated systems and reducing drought risk in rain-fed system. Again, that's another uh, complex uh, issue in when you are doing cropping systems design. That's I was mentioning the, um, the um, Bangladesh issues, trying to uh, use surface irrigation, dry season fallow, and then you can see the crop sequence you can get, and you can see the benefits you get also in terms of timing by suppressing the primary tillage. Quite interesting. Uh, coming to the technologies, and that was shown also in the presentation before, we just have am amazing technological breakthrough, and I think we do m more for less, better, easier, faster, and cheaper. That was my work in 1997. I could cover two hectares. I have a mosaic of five or six pictures, and it would take me 
two days of artwork to just create a mosaic and, and start uh, analyzing the image. Uh, this, is, this was done in uh, less than uh, 20 minutes flight. It's a mosaic, I think, of 40 or 50 different images, high resolution. Uh, improved management practices, and that's all the field work we are doing. Upscaling, downscaling, I think that the example of the Green Seeker is a good one. Data articulation, fusion, assimilation is becoming more and more complex, but we have more and more tools to deal with that. Socioeconomic uh, issues are important, marketing issues are important, the cross-regional learning also in what we do is very important. We don't have the comparative advantage to work upstream in remote sensing, and we really need to partner better with advanced research institutions. The public-private partnership also, uh, and, and it involves also image provider in terms of satellite imagery, uh, capacity buildings of NARS and extension services. And that's my last slide, Matthew. Uh, if you are more interested, you can find with an exciting uh, remote sensing workshop uh, linked to agriculture. Phenotyping was well represented in that workshop. And that's available on uh, our May CRP website. Thank you very much.